Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. And everyone, I must tell you, I can't begin to tell you how thrilled we are to uh, welcome you to this preview to All Is Love, the production that marks our Kerner Hall debut, interestingly enough, and our return to live theater at last after a hiatus of more than two years. I'm very proud of the fact that Opera Italia is one of the first out the gate this winter returning to live theater. I know it, it was a difficult decision. We had plenty of pressure and plenty of reason to hedge our bets and even to cancel. And there are major arts organizations in Ontario that did cancel because we all were wondering, could we possibly have the lockdown extended still further? And the moment you say that you're doing something and you sign your contracts with your artists, naturally, and it's only fair, those artists need to be paid whether we perform or not. So it was a calculated risk, but it was a risk that was based on positivity. It was a risk that has paid off. And this is something that, that all of us at Opera Italia feel very, very strongly. We believe it is our responsibility as an arts organization to provide meaningful opportunities for our artists and for the artistic community to continue creating. We believe it is our responsibility to create an atmosphere of positivity for you, for our artists, but particularly for you, our audience members. You know, over the past couple of years, we have been fed a great deal of fear, and, and at times with good reason. But why would we as an arts organization want to cultivate fear? We want to cultivate tenacity. We want to cultivate courage. We want to cultivate beauty. And we want to cultivate a return to life in which the arts can play an integral part in your well-being. And that's exactly what all is love is about. Reintroducing the arts into your life, having you come and join us for a live performance. As Alex mentioned, at Kerner Hall, the doors will be open for a full hour, so there will be no crowding as people come in. We have just a 50% capacity. So the hall itself will not be crowded. All of the precautions are there to make certain that you can come to the theater and feel confident and feel welcome and <laughs> celebrate with us in a safe environment. Now, I wanted to show you some of the images that uh, inspired All Is Love and also just a few background images that will give you an idea of what it has been like leading up to this. Now, the very first image that I think is particularly interesting was the reaction in some of the media to the fact that we had announced our return to live theater. The scoop, Opera Italia announces a hopeful return to live performance with a Valentine offering. And of course, we are calling this our Valentine offering. But it's true, it was a hopeful return. And even when we saw this written, we felt excited and we felt slightly sick, hoping, hoping this will indeed happen. And of course it did. This photograph came from our photo shoot with our wonderful Bruce Zinger. It was one of the first opportunities for our artists to start to work together, to touch each other, to be close to each other. And you can see the happiness, the joy of being together is palpable. Let's look at some of the photographs from that shoot. Next photo, please. Here we have our uh, one of our artists of Atelier Valley, uh, Eric De Silva. And it is such a thrill to have Eric back with us again. Eric danced with us a number of years ago, and then he went to the Royal Danish Ballet. After the Royal Danish Ballet, he went to his home in Brazil. And I'm thrilled to say he is back in Canada. He is back with us as an artist of Atelier Ballet, and he will be depicting love on stage. And what a beautiful image of Eric. And next, here he is. Next image, please. Here he is hitting the air in impeccable form with the attributes that we think of as love, with the arrow, with the wings, and with the blindfold. And the next image, a chance for our artists to be together. And again, you can see how happy they are to be in the studio together and actually be in physical contact with each other. And next image, again, a lovely, lovely image of just a few of the artists of Atelier Ballet. And next, please, the image that we all love the most, and we chose as our leading image for All Is Love. And our final image, please. 
And at the end of the shoot, we thought we should have everyone involved. So you see Marcel Canzona with the long blonde hair, our filmmaker who has created such beautiful work for us during the pandemic, who is hugging Xi Yi's thigh, and uh, some of our technical people on either side of them. Again, a wonderful moment at the end of the shoot, and you can feel the anticipation on everyone's part. Now, All Is Love is going to include some elements from our earlier production that was filmed, uh, the production that was called Something Rich and Strange. Something Rich and Strange was meant to be a staged production. It wasn't possible for us to stage it because of the lockdown. And so it turned into a film. But now we can come back to some of those things on stage. And as a film, I'm very, very proud of how it was received. John Doyle's wonderful review, simply cannot recommend it enough. Something Rich and Strange from Opera Italia is gorgeous, moving and electrifying. Astonishing film performance left me odd. Go find it while it lasts at WW, et cetera. Well, now you can go and find elements of something rich and strange live in our All is Love performance. Our next image, please. One thing that you will not see in the performance, I am happy to say, is a mask on any performer. Here we have Tyler Gledhill, bless his heart. Our dancers, I felt so sorry for them. They said that you lose 50% of our performance if our faces are covered. You know, we think of dancers dancing with their bodies. They dance with their face as well. They dance with their entire being. What a wonderful thing for us to be on stage, being able to see each other, see each other's expression, and to know that you will be able to see it as well. Next, please. What you will also see is Gerard Gauthier's huge, beautiful paintings. And Gerard will be talking about them this evening that he has created specifically for this performance. Now, let's take a look at some of our composers. And this will be a big surprise. Next, please. Next image, please. Thank you. Claude Debussy. Now, this is a dream. We've been talking about producing Debussy with Jean Lamont uh, and Tafel Music for years. Jean always agreed. It would be ideal to have instrumentalists who are steeped in the Baroque tradition interpret a piece of music like Pelias et Melisande. And of course, you're going to see the first act of Pelias played on period instruments for this production. And next, please. Ronaldo Hahn, renowned as one of the great writers of French art song, renowned as the lover of Marcel Proust, as the director of the Paris Opera. Again, some of his most beautiful, some of his best love music will be included. And we think that the fit with 17th and 18th century French music is absolutely ideal, but I'll leave that to David to talk about further. And next, how could we talk about love and Baroque music without looking at George Frederick Handel? Here he is, the man himself. And next, Jean-Philippe Rameau, the man closest to all of our hearts, the man when I listen to Debussy, I hear this man. And what a thrill to be revisiting some of his repertoire. And next, Marc-Antoine Charpentier, there he is hanging out with the girls looking dapper and handsome. And uh, really, again, some of our favorite, favorite repertoire. And next, Henry Purcell, and I don't think it would have been complete to be singing about love without having elements of his music represented as well. And of course, all of these excerpts are fully staged, fully costumed. It's going to be an evening that runs like a dream. Now, coming back to the Pelias et Melisson, uh, it's a huge challenge on many, so many levels, but particularly because we are not in set. We're simply going to be on the stage of Kerner Hall, a few set pieces, and Gerard's beautiful paintings that are going to help create atmosphere. But Pelias opens in a forest, and we've been trying to decide how do we depict that. And we've decided that the dancers will become our forest. Our wonderful uh, prop designer, Leslie Norgate, has created beautiful branches and leaves that strap onto their arms and their fingers so that they actually become a moving forest that push 
Gulo and Nelisan to each other in this fateful and dangerous encounter. And so we started looking at pictures of Daphne and Apollo, for example. Next, please. These wonderful images where you see leaves growing out of her fingers. And next. This is a particularly wonderful, wonderful image where we see her practically half tree, half woman. And next. Thank you. And of course, the most famous example of all, Benini's Apollo and Daphne, this astonishing work. And I think this is very much what our dances will look like, the men and the women with the branches and the leaves growing out of their hands and arms. And next. Here we have Mary Gordon, the first Melisande. And I thought this was an interesting image to look at. This beautiful woman who originated the role, not a French woman, but rather a Scottish woman. And interestingly enough, the French press found her pronunciation at times amusing, but at the same time, we're utterly captivated by the beauty of her voice and by her physical presence. Here she is as Melisande. Let's look at another image of her. She was blessed with an extraordinary head of hair, and that is her hair in this beautiful publicity shot. And next, what could be more perfect for the scene in which Pelias becomes drowned in her beautiful hair as she leans out of the tower? I think. Our Melisande is a dead ringer in so many ways. We're so thrilled, next please, that Megan Lindsay is going to be making her role debut as Melisande for us. This beautiful image that you will recognize from our production of Resurrection. And next please, another gorgeous image of Megan. And she assures me that since then her hair has continued to grow and it's the longest it's ever been. I'm sure it's going to be superb, vocally and visually. Now, one thing that I think is interesting, you know, in Pelias and Melisande, this is such a strange story. Who is Melisande? It seems that she's a fairy, that she's a creature that has somehow landed on earth or landed in the forest. When we meet her, she's terrified, she's frightened, she's disoriented. It seems that she doesn't even recognize what a human being is until she slowly starts to get her bearings. And there seems to be a real relationship between Melisande and both mermaids, these water creatures who are so attracted to human beings, but also to Melusine, the wonderful half dragon, half woman of legend. Let's see some of the images of Melusine that are so fascinating. Here she is having told her husband that he must never look at her when she is in the bath. And now we see why with her fantastic snake tail and her wonderful fins. Another image of her, of Melusine. Yes, I love this engraving of her in the bath. And next, another marvelous image of her as her husband spies on her. Now, Melusine, mermaids, Melisande, all of these women, for the most part, they are incredibly dangerous. They're not dangerous because they hate human beings. They are not dangerous because they want to destroy men. They are dangerous because they find human beings absolutely irresistible. They are fascinated by them and they don't realize it is impossible for a human being and a fairy, uh, a supernatural creature of this sort to be intimate without one of them being destroyed. Let's look at some of these fantastic images of mermaids from the past. When I think of Melusine, I think of something like this, this beautiful, innocent woman and in the first scene when Gulo, who is lost in the woods, is attracted to her. She's not luring him. She is someone who simply is alluring. And she becomes more dangerous in a rather ambiguous way as the scene progresses. And the next is wonderful Frederick uh, Layton image. Again, this beautiful creature who is in love with the young man that she is about to drag into her element. She wants him because she's in love with him. But being in love with him and taking her into his element, she is going to destroy him. The next by Edwin Byrne Jones, spectacular image. Again, nothing evil about this woman, simply wanting to have this beautiful youth with her. And a more recent version of that by Roberto Ferry, this extraordinary piece again of a mermaid sinking into the depths with a young man who she has fallen in love with. And I'm going to go to one final image called the spring by Ferdinand Hodler. 
This is an artist that all of us at Opera Italia absolutely adore. His wonderful sort of symbolist paintings. He was the most famous Swiss symbolist painter. And there's something about this image that makes me think of the first act of Helios that we will be producing. You see, once Melisande has calmed down, she starts to become fascinated by Gulo, almost as though she has never seen a human being before, has never seen a man before. And after at first being terrified of him and saying, don't touch me, don't come near me, she's suddenly fascinated by him. She goes up and touches his temples and says, your temples are gray. She touches his beard and says, your beard has gray in it. And of course, she's so beautiful, he instantly responds romantically. And then she's frightened and says, why are you looking at me that way? What, what are you doing? What, why, why are you gazing at me that way? There's this complete breakdown in communication. And somehow when I look at this beautiful image by Hobler of his son, Max, and this beautiful young girl who seems to be overwhelmed by his presence, it makes me think so much of the scene that we will be depicting with Megan Lindsay as Madison and with Douglas Williams as Gulo. It, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, exciting undertaking for us the entire evening. I'm so thrilled that you will join us. I hope you will bring someone with you as your Valentine, as you enjoy our Valentine gift to you. And now I'm going to pass this over to our set designer, Gerard. Hello, welcome this evening. Uh, I'm very pleased to have you here. And uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you about the set. I'm going to talk to you about what the set is and what it isn't. And so first of all, I'll talk to you about what it isn't. Um, <clears throat> now this is our debut at Kerner Hall. Uh, we are very, very excited to be playing here, finally in a brilliant acoustic. Uh, the challenge for me, however, is that Kerner Hall is it's a concert hall. It's it's not a it's not a theater. So it has some pretty severe limitations around what you can do scenically in that space. Uh, for me, I love the hall. I think it's perfect. Uh, uh, but I but I think it has an it has a very very large personality. <laughs> it has a big presence, um, and and I don't think it's worth fighting that presence. I think. The designer needs to let the hall be what it is, and, th and that's what I've done. So set pieces, we have a double staircase. We have two benches. We have a bed of poppies, and we have a large projection screen. So really, instead of talking to you tonight about, about a set, I'm going to talk to you tonight about painting, because scenically, this show is really about painting for me. Uh, now, every artist, or most artists, uh, most painters, uh, when they um, start a work, they're, they're, they're faced with a, a blank canvas with a white rectangle and they have to deal with that somehow. And, and that's what I'm presenting to you uh, on, when you come to see the show. There is the white rectangle of a projection screen hanging over, over the stage. And I like to think of it as, as the blank canvas on which I will unfold uh, a series of paintings, each painting um, uh, accompanying a selection in the evening's program. Um, when I paint for the stage, I paint, or I create a rendering, I hand the rendering to scenic painters and the scenic painters, they uh, realize it for me. Um, but they realize it through their own hands and through their own style. So there's always a little bit of uh, disappointment for me that I'm not seeing my hand exactly represented on stage here uh, because the works are will be digitally scanned and then projected. Every single millimeter of that projection screen will be mine. Everything will look as if it just came off of my brush. There's no interpretation. There's no. There's there's nothing between me and you. Um, some of the images you will recognize as scenic images that I've produced on the stage. And, the, and, and these are the images that will mostly accompany the, the Baroque works. You know, they have a kind of sort of clear sort of rational logic to them. 
but as Marshall's been telling you, we are, we are finally venturing into the 19th century, into the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, which is very exciting for us. And it takes, it allowed me to go into a different space and into a different world. Um, when sort of listening to this music, reading the, the, the lyrics to the songs. So um, let's go to the first slide because the, I would say the primary influence for the works that I've, the new works I've created for the show come from, um, from symbolist works from the period known as symbolism. Symbolism was an artistic movement that was very popular in France and particularly in Belgium. And symbolism was a reaction against naturalism. Symbolism wanted to depict um, ultimate truths uh, symbolically. It was more about spirituality. It was more about the imagination. Um, here we see a painting by Gustave Moreau. Moreau was probably the most famous of the French symbolists. You've probably all seen his work reproduced on uh, book covers and posters. Um, this is a very famous image of his, uh, of Jupiter and Semele. And interestingly, we um, have a selection from Handel Semele in the show. Uh, but you can see he created these kind of Byzantine worlds of incredible detail and very strange and, and mysterious and hard to pin down and certainly not, not, this is not naturalism in any way. And so I found for the 19th century and 20th century works, because they're so evocative, they're so hard to pin down. Um, this was what, these were the kind of works I would look at before I started working. And then I would allow my imagination to run wild. If I'm designing a set, I'm usually, um, uh, I spend a lot of time drawing, a lot of time drafting, a lot of time getting perspective right, uh, a lot of time thinking things out, thinking about the libretto, where we have to be, what has to happen in a scene. It's not, this is not, this was not the creative process for me this time around. And it was, it was a kind of liberating experience. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun to just take in images, listen to music, read the words to the songs, and then allow to flow out what, what was, what flew out, so to speak. Anyway, let's look at the next slide and, and I'll, I'll show you how that happened. Uh, one of my um, uh, favorite symbolists is a French symbolist. His name is Odion Redon. And the symbolists like to take their influences or their inspiration from, from poetry, from literature, from mythology, from the Bible. This is Ray Dawn's interpretation of Ophelia, Shakespeare's Ophelia surrounded by flowers. And it's a very magical um, image that is sort of conjures up Ophelia, but it, it conjures up a very sort of magical uh, unreal world in which she is, uh, in which she lives, in which she's floating in. Um, he used pastel often, which gave uh, his surface is a kind of phosphorescence. The colors are, are, are almost shocking. They're so vivid and intense and his color combinations were, are so uh, unusual, very unusual for the period, revolutionary in the period. Uh, a great, great favorite of mine and I know of Marshall and Jeanette's as well. Um, if we look at the next slide, uh, you will see the, the image that I created for the piece uh, Nuit d'Etoile, the Night of Stars. And uh, this is uh, a Debussy piece. And it talks about uh, uh, the, the forest, the starry night. I'll just read you a few, a few words here. Uh, starry night beneath your veils, beneath your fragrant breezes, with sad harp sighing, I dream of past loves. <clears throat> Reading those words, I sat in front of my blank canvas, listened to the music, and um, this is the image that came out, sort of layer by layer. Uh, I thought of the, of the forest, of the forest illuminated by the moon at night. Um, this whole idea of a lost love. For me, it conjured up a kind of iconic love, not, a li not necessarily a, a literal one, but almost a literary one, uh, almost like Dante's Beatrice. And so I, I superimposed an image of a Renaissance beauty 
Um, the text also talks about uh, this love's eyes as stars and, and lips as a rose. And so the, the stars, um, I sort of sprayed them on with, with a brush. And then um, the roses I painted in, not necessarily as literally as, as lips, but there was this whole sort of notion of fragrance of flowers, um, of layer upon layer. And the fun thing for me in creating these works is I just listen. There is no, I'm not dictating anything. I listen. I paint, I allow it to grow sort of layer on layer on layer, and then it tells me when it's finished. And um, uh, let's look at the, the next image, please. Uh, this is a great image by Jean Delville. Delville was a Belgian symbolist, and uh, this is the head of Orpheus, the dead Orpheus, of course, uh, floating in the water um, uh, in his lyre. And um, uh, this, uh, this image I looked at when, we, when I was uh, dealing with the, the, uh, the, the excerpt from Peleas et Melisande. Uh, Marshall and I were talking about it and, and part of that excerpt talks about Melisande's crown or a crown that has fallen into, into the water, into the, into the pond. And uh, uh, Gulo offers, he sees the, clown, the crown glittering in the water and offers uh, to, to uh, retrieve it for her. And she doesn't want it. She, she, uh, she's terrified of it. She wants it to stay in the water. And somehow this sort of image came into my mind. And, and so from here, I, I created the next um, slide. So here it is. So here is that crown sort of floating in the water. The, uh, one of the recurring uh, images for me uh, with all of these is, is the moon. The crowns and, and crowns and moons feature uh, largely here. It's a very symbolist, uh, very symbolist kind of images. We don't see the moon here, but we see the reflection of the moon. We see the crown sort of hovering in a, in a strange way just off the surface of the water. So this image will appear at the moment when these two characters are singing this passage from Peleas et Melisande. Um, uh, so let's look at the, at the next image, please. Ah, here, a great favorite of mine. This is, this is Roussel. Roussel is, is one of the sort of lesser known uh, symbolists. And as, a, as a, a child, I started buying art books at David Mervish um, uh, art bookstore. He had an art bookstore on, on um, uh, Markham Street. And I would collect whatever happened to be on sale. And there was a, a volume of Roussel uh, lithographs and it came with a little folio in the back and you could un unfold the folio and it had all of these plates. And as a young person, I did not understand these at all. They looked very fuzzy to me, very out of focus. You could just sort of make things out in them. And uh, I was a bit immature for this. So I folded these, this, this folio up, I put it in a slipcase and put it back on the shelf. And years later, I took it out and it really spoke to me because what I loved so much was the fact that the image was there, but not there. It's, it was very suggestive. And um, when I heard the music for Ronaldo's Han, uh, L'Eure Exquise, The Exquisite Hour, I had the sense, it reminded me of Roussel. It reminded me because it was, it, it, it sort of floated in the air in a, in a way almost like, like perfume. Um, so I sort of opened up that folio again and looked at them and um, I created the next image that you'll see on the screen. So here we are. So uh, Lyric Skis, uh, it has some very, very, beautiful, uh, beautiful words. It says the pond reflects <clears throat> a deep mirror, the silhouette of the black willow uh, where the wind cries. And I love the idea of the re reflection of a willow tree. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing more romantic than a willow tree and then a reflection of a, a willow tree. I mean, you can't beat that. And it's that, it's the exquisite hour. It's that moment when day turns to night. And here, um, I painted in the moon, the centaur, I mean, I suppose that's a little gift from Roussel. It sort of surfaced um, in the painting. The bats, I thought of um, Whistler uh, using um, sort of bats and butterflies in his images. 
but it wasn't, it wasn't quite right. There was something that was missing from this image. And then I realized it, ne it needed, or I didn't realize, I was told it needed the sun. It needed the setting sun reflected in the water, which you see at the upper right, <clears throat> to tell us, to let us know that it is that moment of transition, which is a very sort of magical moment. Uh, it's a very magical time of the day. Uh, a painting that happened very, very quickly. Some of them took longer, some of them were very quick. This one just sort of flew off the brush in a very, very uh, impressionistic way for me. Um, uh, so uh, a very sort of magical uh, painting experience as well as a, a magical listening experience. And let's look at the, uh, the last or the second last image here. Aha, something a little bit different. <clears throat> this is um, a pre-Raphaelite painting. Uh, by uh, a lesser known uh, female painter. Her name was Evelyn de Morgan. And I always think of the symbolists as the bridge between the Pre-Raphaelites and the Surrealists. The Pre-Raphaelites, uh, I love the Pre-Raphaelites. Uh, they have a, a bit of a literal streak about them. They like storytelling in a very definite sort of way. Uh, sometimes, often, in a very moralizing way, and sometimes in a very sentimental kind of way. Uh, but they're gorgeous, gorgeous things. <clears throat> and, um, and the Surrealists, of course, they're sort of out there on another planet. Um, um, their imagery has more to do with the unconscious, with dreams, with strange psychic sort of connections and images. And um, this image, uh, I, I loved because once again, it's talking about, it's talking about night and day. And um, I had a final painting to do for uh, a piece called Curtain Tune. Uh, Curtain Tune is written by Locke, 17th century. Um, and uh, of course it's an instrumental piece. There are, there are, no, uh, there are no words. Um, and uh, for me, this piece, really needed to work with what was happening on stage. And Curtain Tune, you'll see when you, when you come, that um, there is a figure uh, being danced by Tyler Gledhill uh, and a, a sort of symbolic figure of sleep. Uh, he wears a beautiful sort of silk pajama and he has a poppy in, behind his ear. And he puts the, the, the dancers, uh, the performers on stage uh, to sleep. And this, for me, the, the, the projection screen hovering above the stage needed to somehow crown, so to speak, that moment on stage. It needed to, it needed to crystallize that moment on stage. Um, so with this image in mind, I created the next painting. So once again, it's an image of, it's an image, a nighttime image. It's an image of sleep. Um, and of course, sleep is often associated with uh, poppies, um, uh, which you know we, we have on stage. Tyler will even he will even pluck the petals of a poppy as he, as he moves makes his way to the foot of the stage. Uh, and this is one of those images that images that I questioned uh, as it, it was being painted. Um, uh, it, I loved the idea of a goddess opening her cloak and a field of poppies cascading down from that. Uh, I felt it would sort of crown the, that moment on stage very, very beautifully. And then the more I painted it, the more I realized it needed to be a night image. Um, uh, so hence you see the, the crescent moon in the background, the stars in the background. Uh, the Evelyn de Morgan, which I was looking at, was actually called Aurora Triumphus. So it's, it's a Aurora, the goddess of the dawn, triumphing over the night. Here it's the other way around in a sense. This is night opening her cloak, putting the people to, on stage to sleep and, uh, and ushering in the night. So um, I persevered and persevered with this painting. Uh, I came home one evening and I told my partner, Robert, that um, I had a lousy day because I I'd spent a lot of time working on something that I was gonna throw in the garbage. And then the next day I came in and, and sat back Listened to the listened to the music again. Got out of my head. Allowed it to complete itself, and and this is uh, this is where it went. And and as it turns out, I was very happy with it. So for me, the whole sort of this whole experience has been a very um, sort of magical one, uh, an unexpected one. 
um, uh, you know, love comes into our lives frequently in unexpected ways. It takes us to unexpected places. So for me, even the creative process was a very loving kind of experience. And, um, and of course, uh, none of these images are complete without the music that accompanies them. And on that note, I'm going to pass you on to our uh, music director and our conductor, David Wallace. Thank you, Gerard. And uh, what a thrilling introduction to what we will be seeing when we all come. I can't wait. Uh, I see one of the questions is about uh, the the paint. How many paintings? I don't know how many of their are going. To, how many of your paintings are there going to be in the show? Every single thing on that on that projection screen is mine. I understand, but how many new? How many images then? I, you know, I haven't it done has, a count. I haven't done it a has count. To be twenty, Gerard. It must be twenty. We have that a, a fantastic. Three or more. That yeah, is 2022. Yep. Yeah. Anyways, it's so thrilling to hear of a of a new way that we can really see your paintings too to be projected during the music and the dance and the performances, the singing. And um, as you suggested, this is really something new for you, um, which is what's one of the things that makes this whole evening so exciting for all of us. And then Marshall has alluded to what's especially new from the musical point of view, um, which as we as Marshall mentioned, there are a number of our favorite uh, Baroque composers who will be represented, Handel and Purcell and Lully, and you, you mentioned Locke, uh, the Locke curtain tune there, Gerard, he's not so well known, but a wonderful, wonderful composer, English composer. And uh, we will, many of us will know some of these pieces. Uh, they're taken from some of Purcell's operas or semi-operas, from Handel's operas, from Lully's operas, and they're all in the idea of what we've been talking about, the images or, or, or ideas of sleep, of transformation, of enchantment, of spells, sometimes for good or for evil, almost. You have to be very careful of, of some of the spells which are cast in the music. Um, and uh, But what's really new for us is the fact that we are combining with these composers from the late 19th, early 20th century. Now, in choosing the two composers who are represented, Ronaldo Hahn and Claude Debussy, it's not that we just thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to have something that comes from that period, although, of course, that's true. But we wanted to be sure to have composers which were had something in common with earlier musics and earlier aesthetics and points of view. Um, I think maybe it's fair to say that Ronaldo Hahn is the lesser known of these two composers. Claude Debussy is famous for many wonderful orchestral pieces, and those of us who are pianists love his piano music and so on. And uh, but Ronaldo Hahn uh, was—I mean, it was partly because during his lifetime, not only was he a composer, but he was a very fine conductor, opera conductor, and in fact, he was one of the first to take. Mozart, seriously, what Mozart wrote in his scores, he would always insist that whatever Mozart wrote, we should try and, and replicate on stage and in the music making. It was very interesting, which was not what was done at the turn of the, the 19th into the 20th century. You approached Mozart as if you just were creating something brand new. Uh, so it's very interesting that way. He also loved um, French uh, lute songs. Um, and you'll in his some of many of his beautiful songs for piano and voice. There's a real echo of French lute songs, and uh, he wrote texts. He wrote uh, uh, one of his most famous orchestral pieces is pretending to be a ball at the court of of Beatrice d'Este of the the, the 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 d'Este family, one of the great Renaissance uh, dynasties, and he is pretending to have a, a ball at this one of these courts. So you, you can see how influenced he was by even 16th century uh, aesthetic. And the same with Claude Debussy. And the thing that really, really has struck me, and I know Marshall, as we've prepared for our rehearsals, which are starting tomorrow, and, and the, the opening scene from Peleas, there are no arias, there's no big set pieces. We couldn't ask someone to come and like uh, uh, Meg, uh, Lindsay and say, oh, sing one of Melisande's famous sections. You know, there's just, there isn't such a thing. There's no big set pieces. And what it's very much like is Claudio Monteverdi and the way he approached setting a text and telling a story. Now, the story that's being told is 
almost impossible to really decide what's going on. But that's the, what the, the whole idea of part of this, this obscurity. And, and Monteverdi's stories are not, not like that. But even so, the story is being told in a very straightforward manner, paying real attention to the way a great actor might read that text, and then using some very strange harmonies to kind of just color in the background, almost like your images, I can imagine, Gerard. It's like it's this beautiful harmony which is rendered in color. There are these beautiful harmonies which Debussy adds. And so we're absolutely thrilled to be doing it. And I, I do hope that people will see that this is not just uh, completely arbitrary, our choices. They, they really make sense, I believe. And um, some of you, of course, will know Peleas and Melisande from some wonderful performances you may have seen. And you think, well, are we having the whole orchestra? Well, no, we're not having the whole orchestra. That would take a 70-piece orchestra to, uh, to do it. So we actually commissioned our wonderful assistant conductor, Chris Bagan, to do an arrangement, a reduction, if you will, of, um, the, of the orchestration for this opening scene for 12 instruments. But it works extremely effectively. Um, I've obviously examined it at quite some care and worked on it with Chris a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, all the beautiful wind colors that Debussy uses are there and the contrast between the strings and so on. And we're so pleased that our friends at Tafel Music have been willing to, to the, the string players, for instance, will just take up later 19th century style bows, but they will still be on their Baroque stringed instruments, gut stringed instruments for the rest of the evening. But of course, in Debussy's time, there were still gut strings on all the strings in the orchestra. So it's really going to be a thrill to hear the sound and a, a great uh, journey of exploration for the players as well. So we're just, we can't be more thrilled. And it's, uh, it's, then of course, we have a wonderful uh, group of singers, some of whom um, you'll be very familiar with. And uh, some people singing some new repertoire that you won't have heard before. And this is a great segue. I'd love to introduce to you and someone who has performed with us, but not a, that often. And Danielle, it's so wonderful that you're able to join us again for this live production. Danielle, many of you will remember her from the film of Something Rich and Strange, where she sang one of Handel's great arias from Alcina, speaking of a, an enchantment, enchantment opera. So Danielle, I wonder if you might just tell us a little bit, of, especially about your, your big solo in the evening. Thank you so much for the introduction and for uh, uh, Top Retelier for having me again. I'm very grateful to be working with you all again. Um, so I wanted to talk about the inspiration um, behind my performance for this piece. And I collected pictures of my grandparents. There's a couple black and white photos that you'll see here. Um, well, they were in Canada. So these are the, the black and white ones from 1956. And um, which was not long after they immigrated to Canada from Italy. So I think these were taken in High Park and they're very much in love. And the aria that I'm singing is uh, Mi Lusinga il Dolce Affetto and from Handel's Alcina. So Ruggero is under the spell of Alcina, but we've slightly taken it out of context. Um, but yet what is said in the aria relates to the photos that I've selected. And I just like to read a bit of the text I am charmed by the sweet emotion inspired by the face of my beloved. Yet who knows, it would be prudent to be cautious so that I do not make the mistake of falling in love again. But if this woman were the one I love and I were to abandon her again, then I would be unfaithful, an ungrateful wretch, cruel and a betrayer. So this aria highlights a central theme of conflict and I believe that's the conflict of choice. So should our protagonist uh, choose to engage with the object of his love, um, he recognizes the inevitable suffering which awaits him. Um, yet this outcome seems to his mind the only reasonable outcome. And so this explicit theme of conflict is whether to love or not. And the ironic thing about the decision to love was never a decision from the beginning because Ruggiero already loves Alcina and, uh, and the consequence of that is to suffer. And 
I'm, I'm mentioning suffering um, because in the next photo you'll see, this is a color photo I provided in present day. Here is my grandfather um, staring at my grandmother through the glass separated by the pandemic and unfortunately separated by a very slow death, uh, which is Alzheimer's disease, the, as, the long goodbye, as they call it. So Ruggiero was compelled just as my grandfather. And there's a striking parallel here. Um, which lends itself to the inspiration behind uh, my performance. So on one hand, you have the suffering and the continuance to love, uh, sorry, the continuance to love the object of desire, which is in this aria. But on the other hand, you have my experience, um, which is watching my grandfather choosing to continue to hold on to this hope. Um, uh, his object of love, that is my grandmother, every day throughout the course of her illness. Um, so there's a reason here behind the passion that is necessary for um, my artistic expression and, and the artistic expression of many of these pieces that will be showcased. Um, so I just wanted to conclude this in, in showing the, the last picture from um, the 2020 production of Something Rich and Strange. And um, this is, um, well, Ruggiero or myself um, surrendering to all that is love and all of its joy, all of its pain, all of its heartache. And yeah, so I'm very much looking forward to performing this again and um, with many more layers. And so, I'd like to pass along the baton to Jeanette. Thank you, Daniel. That was lovely. And music, yeah. music is something that expresses so many things that we can't put in words. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, I, I've shown uh, all, most of you the dance notation that I've worked from. Uh, as you know, I've, I've reconstructed many dances and then used those as a takeoff point for my own choreography. But another aspect that is really wonderful uh, when you're studying dance history is the visual pictures as well as the descriptions of the dancing masters. And I've chosen a few of my favorites to share with you tonight because they have an ineffable quality that I think was really something that people tried to start during the Renaissance in art and in their own behavior, in their own uh, ethos right through the Baroque, and I think it went up to uh, Ronaldo and, and uh, Debussy as well. And I just hope that these pictures speak to you as they do to me, uh, showing uh, the sense of, of, of subtlety, refinement, uh, and um, manners and harmony that we don't always see today. Uh, we'll have the first image, please. This is the great dancer Vestris and uh, one, his partner. And you can see that movements are, they're not strained. They're not, they're holding beautiful props, which you'll definitely see us doing as Marshall described, but they're in uh, positions that allow them to, to maintain their grace. I think perhaps grace was the major uh, aspect, um, the major quality they were aiming for both in life and on stage effortless grace, making an effort was not graceful. And so the dancing is meant to flow harmoniously, as were the people. Uh, one of the, next image please, one of the painters that caught this wonderfully was great Watteau. Here is a couple dancing, and there was this idea of the fête galante, the idea of an outdoor um, picnic kind of idea where people would dance and play music and just enjoy being together. And it's a beautiful, pastoral sort of Arcadian feel to it. You can see again, the movements are graceful. Men and women are very equal in Baroque dancing. And it's very much shared with the group. It's not like the waltz. It's something where you close yourself off. It's, it's a group activity, even if it's a couple dancing, although it looks as though there's a woman on the swing behind them with her back <laughs> to them, but most of people are, are participating. And next image, please. 
This is just a close up. You can see how quiet their faces are. The and yes, the softness of the hands, the this was about as, uh, as close as you got in Baroque dance in terms of holding on to each other it was just a gentle holding of the hands. The arms are not generally lifted up high. There's no sense of stress or striving. It's all grace. And the next one, please. This male dancer in perfect, perfect Baroque pose. You're going to see poses like that on stage. If you're an opera atelier fan, you've seen them before. But he expresses all of the beautiful, relaxed energy of Baroque dancing. Another Watteau. And next, please. Here's another Fête Galante. This one is by Potter. You can see the costumes are very similar to ours. The positions. And again, it just shows the lovely, idyllic, again, Arcadian quality that people were trying to put into their lives as well as what was going on on stage. And I'll just run through a few more images that are more of the same. Actually, the next one uh, is a bit different. It's Louis XIV. He's in a position uh, he's playing the character of war, which was actually quite suited to him for some of his life, although I think he re regretted it later. But again, he's carrying props that show what his character is, even though his positions are still harmonious and graceful. And the next one, please. This is one of my favorite dancers, Marie-Madeleine Guimard. She was known uh, as the most famous ballerina of the 18th, the later 18th century. She, uh, somebody described her uh, saying that she sketched the, fig the dances. She, her dances were a sketch of the steps. It was, uh, it was very subtle. And, uh, and again, these costumes relate quite a bit to some of the things that we'll be wearing. And next. This is an earlier famous ballerina called Camargo. She was uh, known for her virtuosity, but you can see that she's still not straining. She's uh, in a beautiful position. This is one of my favorite positions. You'll see it again and again in my choreography. And the man, of course, dancing with her, uh, not trying to out, they're not competing. They're, he's not just lifting her. He's her equal partner. She's this equal partner. They're facing out to the audience and the other um, people are participating with them, enjoying the dance. And next, please. Next, please. Oh, now this is this is fun because it's a little piece from Commedia dell'arte. This is a dancer dancing with Pulcinella, and you can see he's ogling her. The um, Commedia dell'arte dancing was a little bit more acrobatic and vulgar than what than the Baroque noble court style, and this is sort of a combination of the two. And you can see the the musician musicians in the back accompanying them. Next, please. Here's a close up, and the artist obviously enjoyed Camargo so much that he painted a solo picture of her in the same position. And again, one of my favorite positions as well, and the beautiful costume, which has been so inspiring for us. And next, this is a Tiepolo showing a country dance, a Venetian country dance, uh, probably the Forlana, which is something that I have reconstructed and uh, enjoyed very much. You can see that it's a little bit less restrained. You can actually see her ankle and uh, a little bit of her pantaloons. But uh, again, people are enjoying it. Someone's actually climbed a ladder to watch. Yes, Harlequin. And, uh, yeah, Harlequin, of course, ogling, but uh, very much in the Commedia style, this dance. And I think that's my last one. I have a close up of the same, I believe. Next, please. Is there? Thank you. So you, you can see again, they're, they're uh, Wonderful man. Yes, you can see the Commedia figures there. If this is a Venetian painting, although Commedia was big in uh, in France as well, the Italian comedians. And that's the end of mine. I think Alex is going to come for the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Those were some really uh, beautiful images. Um, yes, an early masking, says Paul. <laughs> Yeah, an early exa example of some other masks. Um, so I had a couple of questions and I'll see if anything else pops up. So um, Wayne had asked about how many of uh, Gerard's paintings are in the show and we had a bit of an answer for that. And he was asking about the medium. So can you just address briefly, Gerard, the medium? Uh, all the paintings are, are actually acrylic on, uh, on board, um, on, on wooden panels. Um, uh, I find acrylic is very, um, 
fast, it's very forgiving, and it allows me to layer um, images on top of images on top of images. Um, so I frequently have a paintbrush in one hand and a hairdryer in the other. Um, <laughs> But it, but it's a, it's a nice fast medium, and um, uh, I use it for I use it for everything. I use it for the set designs. I use it for, for my personal paintings as well. Thanks, Gerard. Uh, David, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where the orchestra is going to be. Well, uh, I don't. Uh, it's not always the case at uh, Kerner Hall because, of course, I think many of us have been to concerts there, and uh, it's just the as it were, not just as the musicians on stage, the orchestra or the choir, or the singers are take up the stage space. But in fact, the front of Kerner has a, a movable hydraulic, basically where you can create a pit. Uh, it's not used unless it's necessary, but it's uh, they were very smart in building that in. So it does mean that they, even though, as George says, this is not a, a theater, it's a concert hall, basically. But they did understand that there might be occasions like this one coming up in two weeks time where there's going to be wonderful visuals, uh, singers being staged, dancers, lighting, ev costumes, everything on the stage. So we will be in a, a kind of created pit at the front, just as if we were in the Elgin. Um, and so, uh, no, I, we're looking forward to that very much. And um, the other thing is that, you know, that I think I maybe alluded to the fact that there are three occasions where we're doing songs for voice and piano, and the piano will just be over to one side and uh, a, a baby grand and the singer will be on stage so we'll be at the front and i'll be there and helping out as i need to and as as usual so in that sense it will feel quite theatrical in a way the way it's been set up and you'll have a great view of the stage all the while that's great and the piano is on the stage or in the pit oh well, we, we decided just to put it it's it's in one of the little boxes, right, Marshall? I think that's where we fell. Yeah, it's on the same level as the stage, but we put. But it you know, the, I don't know if you know, at the front of the corner there are these boxes, which it yeah. it, it you don't. And there's no proscenium, so it feels almost like it's on stage. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. some of our performers will actually be moving from the stage to the piano, and there will be a real connection between our pianist Ben uh, Ben Crutchley and the performers, like Misha, for example. Right. That's great. And Marshall, someone's asking about. Um, uh, if this scene from Peleus is is going to be a precursor to doing the full opera, you bet it is. <laughs> absolutely, that's a that's an absolute dream. And we've talked about this for a long time, Jeanette and me and Gerard and David and and uh, Jean Lemon, Tafel Music. This is something we've talked about a great deal. It's a real dream. And uh, now, saying a uh, complete Peleus, I also want to make clear. One of the things that makes Pelias so challenging, one of the many things, is the extended orchestral passages that happen uh, with, with no, for no apparent reason. They simply are there. What do you do? Just sit back and have the audience listen to the orchestra. Do you close the curtain? But in reality, a great deal of that music was written specifically to accommodate set changes, which apparently were extremely elaborate in the original performance. I don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot and say we're going to play every note because it's Debussy and it's all genius. Some of it was there for a very prosaic reason. And I think we will make our own decisions in that respect. The thrilling thing about this music for us is what it means in terms of storytelling, how the text is delineated, and what it means for movement and dancing on stage as well. So certainly everything that makes Peleas what it is, which is a literary event as well as a music event, will be there. But we will make some, some, some informed decisions in terms of how much of the purely orchestral music actually serves our purposes. Yes, I should just add, you know, uh, this, Peleas is very unique in a way in operatic history. Well, not completely unique, but pretty close, which is that it, it really was a play first. It was Metterlink's play, and Debussy was always saying, I'm looking for an opera, but I, I need to find the right libretto. But it wasn't a libretto in that sense. It was a play. And uh, so it, it's, you know, it's very unusual that way. And, and that's why I think Debussy approached it in the way he did. He knew he was giving music to a, a full-fledged and quite successful and influential play, um, which, which started. And he was very faithful to Metterlink's text. He didn't, he, there was a few cuts. But other than that, he didn't play around with the text 
Uh, so it's quite unusual that way. There is a real story. If you can figure out what it means, that's a different question. But there's a story and there's wonderful scenes uh, all the way through the piece. So it would be fantastic to do it. Something to look forward to. Thank yes. you. Um, Danielle, uh, there's a question for you. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing that uh, personal background because it was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So um yeah, see, I'm getting weepy. Um, uh, I'm Paul, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Paul is asking if it's typical for you to go so deep working on a character or a song, or is this song different for you? Um, I think given what has happened in the past two years, there are just so many more layers now. Um, and I, you know, consider Opera Atelier to be a saving grace for me in a sense, because I was able to perform during such a, a bizarre time. And so, yeah, I would say within the past couple of years, it's allowed me to go deeper, a lot of time to reflect, a lot of time to study. Um, but I've, I've always been one to put myself in the character's shoes and, and just imagine what life was like for them. Um, yeah. Thanks, Danielle. Um, David, we have a harp in this show. Lots of harps recently. Uh, lots of harps recently. How yeah. do you? Right. Well, I think it was a harp in the last show. Was there a harp in Resurrection or Angel? Uh, no. No, we okay. haven't had a. Yeah, there was. I think in Angel was there not? Yes, there was a harp. Isn't that awful? Yeah. In the Adam scene. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Well, I see in, in Ed, Edwin's piece. Yes, you're yes. right. Absolutely. That's yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, um, you know, of course, Debussy writes um, uh, a prominent harp part in it's all the, the harp will only be in the Debussy okay. scene. Okay. Uh, we're not using it at other times because, again, by the time of Debussy, the harp that would have been used in his orchestras was decidedly different mm -hmm. from uh, Baroque harp. So we, we can't sort of switch uh, that much over. So th there's a harp part. But again, it's, it's interesting the way Chris Began, who made the arrangement that we're using, uses the harp. He, he uses it to reinforce pizzicato chords often in the orchestra. Pizzicato is where the string players, instead of using their bow, they pluck their strings. It's a very wonderful effect, especially when you have a whole group of 30 string players all plucking together. And so we don't have 30 string players. So sometimes when there are plucked strings in the, in the string parts, uh, Chris is reinforcing it with the harp. And uh, of course, in terms of this, this sort of sound world, the kind of a beautiful quality of a harp is, is also very, he uses it very, very smartly. And we're, the, the player is someone that, again, like a Tafel music player, she's played with Tafel music, Julia Seeger Scott, who's very well versed in Baroque harp. She was our harp soloist in one of our productions of Monteverdi's Orfeo, for instance. And so um, it's, it'll be wonderful to work with her on this repertoire. Great, thank you. Um, and Marshall, just a shout out to the singers that we have performing in this. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to just to speak about it or do you want me to read the list and, or? I guess, why did you read the list first? Okay, and okay and sure. Um, so we have Colin Ainsworth, Marie Aslan, uh, Misha Berger gossman lee Megan Lindsay, Danielle, of course, uh, mm -hmm. Cynthia Smithers, Douglas Williams, and uh, Remy Mathieu. So you see, we have a wonderful, wonderful group of our many of our favorite singers. And I'm very excited as well that Remy Mathieu it will be joining us. It will be his debut with Opera Italien. Jeanette and I met Remy when we were uh, choreographing and directing the production of um, Richard Coeur de Lyon, the Great Free Opera, uh, over the past couple of years. We produced it once, or we created it once for uh, the Royal Opera House at Versailles. And now we have done a remount of it, tremendously successful. And it was Remy who sang, not the title role, but the starring role of Blondel. And we were so impressed with this young man by his, his beautiful voice, but also his stupendous acting ability, a wonderful, sensitive young Frenchman. And it will be so thrilling to have him on stage for this production in particular. And I hope it will be the first of many times that he comes to join us. The rest of the people, they require no introduction. You know how much we love them and how much we love 
bringing them back together and having them work together with each other, with our singers, with Taufa music, with the whole team. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, I think that wraps up our evening. Um, I want to thank all of you uh, out there for joining us this evening. It really means a lot to us. We look forward to seeing you at the theater on the 19th and the 20th of February at Kerner Hall. Um, please go to operatelier.com and buy your tickets. Um, so thank you so much to Marshall, to Jeanette, uh, Gerard, Danielle, and David, and all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you at the theater. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.